Hello, I'm Emma Smith and welcome to this Heathfield Community College podcast where teachers have a short chat about a specific element of teaching. To help keep us focused, the podcast is split up into three sections. What's a miss? Where we discuss our classroom conundrums and catastrophes. What's lit? An on-trend term for the part where we discuss pedagogy and what we've been reading. And finally, we'll round things off with what's a hit? What do we think is the best classroom practice that we've tried or will really focus on in the coming weeks? Today, our topic is building students' confidence, and I'm chatting with Mark Enser, who is research lead here at Heathfield, and Joe Sheldon, who teaches English and holds responsibility as the college's professional tutor. Joe has also done a lot of work here at Heathfield, researching and helping to improve boys' achievement. Building students' confidence is twofold. There are, of course, the methods that we plan for and use as teachers to help our students feel confident in the acquisition of knowledge, then its application within the discipline of the subjects that we teach. But that is underpinned by the environment that we create in our classrooms to enable students to develop knowledge and apply it properly. Like a lot of things in teaching then, building students' confidence isn't easy. What's amiss with building confidence? Jo, what have you found difficult when it comes to building the right environment or the things that we do to deliver our lessons to help students build confidence? Um, Well, one of the things I used to do an awful lot of was group work in English. It has all sorts of benefits. You know, it's a subject where we encourage discussion and we want students to think and talk to each other about their ideas. But at the same time, it only really helps to increase the confidence of certain students, the ones who are already confident. So there's the problem with it. And what, you know, what I kept finding was that the less confident students were the ones who were the note takers or who were, um, you know, kind of left to their own devices and weren't really participating. And obviously with engagement, that's not a good thing. So that's the thing that I've been thinking about more, trying to figure out how to use it more effectively, how to group students more effectively, so as not to damage the confidence of some of the students who find that, you know, all of that kind of thing much more difficult. Mark? Um, I think... The mistake I've always made in the past is focusing too much on the motivation or the confidence rather than the thing that creates the motivation and confidence. And if I just talk in a motivational way and in a confidence building way, that's going to make them motivated and confident rather than thinking, why do they lack confidence? What can I do to improve their ability in that thing, which will then make them more confident and make them more motivated? So so now increasingly I'm focusing much more on what don't they know? Why are they lacking confidence in this? And how can I show them that actually they can do this thing and focusing on that first? It it is difficult creating the right environment in our classrooms where students can feel feel confidence. Um, Especially when at the start of the academic year, we're trying to do that very, very quickly to create Mm. that, that classroom environment. And we're doing two things. We will have students we've never met before who um, we want them to feel comfortable with us enough so that they will um try out new things perhaps or try and answer our questions even though they might get get scared that they're going to get things wrong um but on the other hand you need to make sure that the conditions for learning in the classroom are right that you are managing behavior to support students that for example if you want to do a bit bit of a difficult task where they need to work in silence for a length of time that you can um get that atmosphere in your classroom environment in your classroom very very quickly um, because actually what you if, when we're talking about building students confidence they need a place to to think and time to think in order to not feel that they're rushed or that there there's so many other voices that are in their heads that they can't take those risks or uh, in their writing so i think that's the other thing with building confidence is that getting the environment right very very quickly at the start of the year is a problem have you found that at all anybody yeah, and I think at the beginning of the year, it's even more important. I mean, I, I'm i not hugely keen on cold calling because English is a subject where students have to think about their own ideas as much as, you know, and interpretations of something. It's not, you know, it's far less about recalling knowledge in some ways. Um, and so giving them thinking time, discussion time with a partner is particularly important so they have a chance to rehearse their ideas and then they feel much more confident sharing them. And of course we're also trying to build their oracy skills so we want them to be able to speak confidently 
you know, perhaps more in sentences rather than in <laughs> single word answers. So we're, you know, we're thinking about confidence in, a, in two different ways there. Um, what's lit? What have we read that has helped to inform our teaching practice? Um, I was reading Carl Hendricks and Paul Kirshner's new book on the science of learning. And there, there was a section in there towards the end looking at kind of some educational myths and ideas. And one of those was coming down to the idea of motivation, confidence versus achievement and, and the kind of direction that it flows in. And so that, that kind of starting point where if I can motivate them, they will become more confident and achieve versus if I can help them to achieve, they will become more confident and motivated. And they were suggesting that the direction flows that way, that there's very little that, that we can really do to motivate and make a student more confident until we show them they can be successful. And so trying to find ways to demonstrate that actually you can do this through careful use of scaffolding and modelling and sharing success criteria is that first step to them becoming more confident. That's really interesting. When, um, when I was looking at um, Why Don't Students Like School by Willingham, it's a kind of a similar thing. He was talking about... Um, you know, it is important for students to feel confident and that we prove to our students that we have confidence in them. But then he was also talking about how the language we use when we are praising students and being careful that it isn't just um, automatically, oh, that's a great piece of work, mm -hmm. uh, when actually the student knows that it's not a great piece of work. And so they know that perhaps we, have, we haven't challenged them effectively mm -hmm. to really raise that bar and the standard and you know it's fine to say to students well it's great that you've got that piece of work in on time well done mm -hmm. however I know that you can write better than that I, I would expect to see full sentences so next time do yeah. that so when we're praising students to kind of demonstrate to them that we know that they are able and that they can do it um, make sure that that praise is genuine and that it still is aspirational. Yeah, Jamie Tom talks in A Quiet Education about using phrases like, I really like the way you've done a particular thing. And he also talks about how important it is to model listening for the students. So to show the students that we are really paying attention to an answer that they're giving or a piece of work that they're sharing so that the other students in the class will pick up those same skills as far as listening is concerned. And he quotes Covey where he says, most people do not listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. And I think a lot of that happens in the classroom with question and answer. Mm. You know, students are listening for key words that we might say that they hook onto to answer a question without really thinking about what their answer might be or how they might um, deepen their answer to share with other people which I think is quite interesting too. So by modelling listening, really careful listening, and picking up on things that students have said or done and commenting on those, we can model for them the way they should be listening and responding in question and answer in the classroom as well. There was a really interesting paper out, I think it was last year, looking at the social aspect of questioning. And that they were looking at the ability of questioning to help with retrieval practice. Yeah. And they found that only the person answering the question gained any benefit of retrieval and that the people listening who you would think would be listening and therefore also retrieving information because they were listening to it mm. gained no benefit and it turns out that yeah, most people aren't listening to the answer they're just sitting back waiting for some kind of cue that is their turn to speak yeah and it just washes right over them um, yeah. so yeah i think that's a really interesting point that yeah links to confidence nicely so taking all of that into consideration, what's the hit then when it comes to building students' confidence? What will help our students, especially in the current context where after lockdown, we might have a few more students than normal who might be lacking in confidence? What are we going to do? I think it's really important that we model a really calm approach in the classroom. So, you know, that we move around, we're going to be moving around a lot less, but actually that helps to create more of a calm atmosphere in the classroom. Um, and, and, you know, being really deliberate about the way that we speak. So only asking questions that we think are really important for them to answer, giving praise that's really genuine and thoughtful mm. in response to a student. Um, and the other thing I've been thinking about is thinking about the seating and trying to seat students next to other people they'll work well with and, you know, trying to really move away from 
a seating plan as a behaviour device and as a as a working device yeah, I in think, the classroom. I think that's such an interesting thing because I know when I first started teaching, I would have every single class, um, boy, girl, regardless. And the more that I've developed in my teaching career, I, I've moved away from that because it's not helpful. If I want the students to discuss an idea before we feed back as a class, then they need to feel confident and comfortable with the person that they're sat, sat next to so that they can have conversations and, again, get things wrong, share ideas. Mm. And then I get a lot more back from them when I say, right, you two over here, what have you, what have you discussed and tell me? And then I get better answers because they're sat with someone where they're not, they haven't been afraid to share new ideas or new thoughts mm. and without being ridiculed. Or... Yeah, and I think that leads to the students trusting the teacher more too, which is an important thing for building confidence and relationships in the classroom. You know, if, if they're not worried that you're going to sit them next to somebody they feel really uncomfortable with, then they are more inclined to think that they are going to participate and that they're going to share their mm. learning with you, I, yeah. I find. Yeah. I, think, I think that's great as long as the behaviour is excellent. And I think we're very lucky as a college that generally we, we, our students are very well motivated, they behave incredibly well. Um, and we have a very good behaviour system which we can apply and use when we need to, so we don't need to use the seating plan as a behaviour strategy. Mm. Um, certainly working in, in other schools, the, the seating plan has to be a behaviour strategy because if it isn't, Students aren't confident to speak because they're afraid of getting hit. You know, so yeah, yeah, true. But here yeah, I agree. I true. think we don't need to use the seating plan as a behaviour strategy. True, and I think choice, sometimes where... it's just about how well you know your classes. Because mm. even with some of uh, perhaps more challenging classes that I teach, sitting one student next to another student who I know they're friends with, even though you know somebody else might walk into my classroom and raise an eyebrow mm. at that particular pairing, mm. does work mm. because they might be on the same academic level sometimes mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. helps them mm -hmm. they're not feeling isolated because they don't know the answer but they're set next to someone who is very very able in that subject and they feel that they can't ask for help mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. those kind of things and I've, I have had, had successful pairings of students who are very similar to ability I know our friends and get along even though I know that their behavior together I, I am going to have to keep an mm -hmm. eye on very carefully so mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I take your point, and certainly I've worked in schools mm. where it has been. That wouldn't work difficult. quite as well, but yeah. I, I agree here it's brilliant. But it's a class yeah. by class basis, absolutely. Because I'll still have classes that are sat a bit more boy girl because they need to. Mm. So um, yeah, I think I will also. Um, it, it goes back to what we're talking about with ver verbal conversations. One of the things that I have been doing a lot more and I just need to remember to do it more now that we're back in the classroom is practicing um, getting students to verbally give me responses before they write. Um, the problem of course in history is is a very written subject and there's always those students who whose confidence stems from they don't know how to start writing they, they're literally afraid to put pen to paper. Yeah. Um, so having me having those conversations with students and saying right what are we going to write? How would you start this if it was just a conversation with me and you? How would you? How would we start that? Mm -hmm. And then saying to them, okay, so let's put that into a sentence. Okay, you feel a bit more confident with that now. Right, now let's write that. And I know that's difficult because obviously with social distancing in our classroom and, and all the things, and probably like a lot of teachers, I have the ones who I know need the most help sat towards the front at the moment but there's other ways you can get around it I think we can use Google Docs for example yeah. is another great way that you can do that and you can say right just to this student give me access I can see yeah. what you're you're yeah. typing which also ties in with private praise doesn't it and being able to praise in a genuine but private way so it's not some kind of performance um, and students see that as being more genuine and are more likely to take that on board and and feel more confident because of it mm. Mark, anything else you're going to um, go for? I think in geography, our most confident students are always the most knowledgeable. The reason they're confident giving an answer in front of their peers is that they know it's right and they know they've got something to say. So for us, anything we can do that helps pupils become knowledgeable helps to make them more confident in our subject. So, so it's, it's back to the basics. It's taking into account retrieval practice, cognitive load theory. You know, everything else that's part of good teaching helps to create more confident students because they know they know it. Mm. Yeah. 
And I think that's about it then. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Joe and Mark, for chatting with me about how we build our students' confidence. It's not easy, but more important than ever at the moment. Our next podcast will be looking at how we can use the good habits we've picked up in lockdown to make our lives easier now that we're all back at the chalk face. <laughs>